Hi, this is Paul. I'm back from my trip to Massachusetts, and I had a chance to look at a bunch of videos. A number of you wrote me and would like me to do some commentary on the John MacArthur Ben Shapiro video. I probably will. I'll probably do some more treatment of the Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro, Dave Rubin video. But this video came up. I was I was on Facebook. I had a little bit of chance to be on the computer. I was on Facebook, and someone tagged me in this conversation, and I just caught the tail end of it. And then they did, in fact, put it on YouTube. And I thought this was quite a good conversation. It's on a smaller channel called the Three the Three Craters, and it's been it's been around quite a while. I uh, I came across Rachel Fulton Brown. She's probably the most famous of the regular panelists in this group. She teaches at University of Chicago. She's a medievalist. She tends to get herself in hot water fairly regularly, it seems. She's had a, a very strong interest in Milo Yiannopoulos, and that comes through. If some of you listen to this entire video, she's she's a, she's quite a defender of him, and she's a little disgusted with, with Jordan Peterson's treatment of him, and, and it seems of her a bit. She's had a couple of conversations with, with Jonathan Peugeot, both of which have been have been quite good. And I, I learned a lot. I listened to the first one. The first one was a year ago, and the second one was a month ago. And I, I actually appreciated both of those conversations quite a bit. She touches a bit. She's, we're going to get into Feuerbach a little bit in this. And, and she's this is from a blog post that she had done a while ago. She blogs about Peterson semi-regularly she did a while ago she might do a little bit more again now that it's getting a little bit of a, a little bit of traction but there were a number of interesting passages in this conversation that I'd like to play and do some commentary on so let's get started a little bit of a brief background I don't have any formal education uh, just kind of a low-level layman factory worker you're a random in, lay person. We love a you. Rand, I am a random lay person uh, who, by coincidence alone, kind of fell in love with the practice of, uh, you know, proper pursuit of truth. And so I, I followed people that I thought were aiming at the truth. And in fact, people that I think, and, and I don't want to say that I'm, uh, that, that I'm dismissed. Now, now, I like this earlier section because this individual, well, let me catch his name. It's up here on the list of uh, Cody. That's right, Cody. Cody, I thought, get, is a nice example of a lot of people I talk to, not necessarily academics or professionals, but one of the beautiful things that YouTube has done is given a lot of people who don't necessarily work academic or necessarily intellectual jobs to continue to explore the life of the mind. And so he describes his odyssey, how he finds Jordan Peterson, why he thinks he's important, and that, that sort of launches this conversation. But what, how, he frames, how he frames his interaction with Jordan Peterson, I found to be a lot like a number of other people who I've been talking to over the last year. So, but I think I'm properly skeptical of people that obviously aren't orienting themselves towards anything honest. Um, and so I tried to follow the right people and I tried to read the right books. So people like Vox, I'm a little bit more skeptical of. The, the purpose of this conversation was to do a treatment of Vox Day's book, Jordanetics. They beat up on the book pretty badly. And I haven't read the book. It seems well-deserved. Most people seem to say that this is a hit piece, but um, that's what the, the overall conversation in this video was because about. I think the evidence that they're not being sincere is obvious to, to anyone that wants to be open-minded and I, I fell in love with jordan roughly speaking with uh, the best video is the little clips of the roughly speaking have you seen yes that? yeah so uh, funny it is so i i, I kind of started following him around the time of the the big c16 argument and then of course i went uh, it was through all of his video history did maps of meaning personality and uh followed him through the summer of the biblical lecture series and for me that i guess what attracted me the most was that i had spent so much time through the previous 10 years trying to reconcile this argument between guys like the four horsemen of atheism and uh you know like the evangelical right wingers that they were always crushing in debate after debate debate after debate and and i i fell in this very uncomfortable position of not agreeing with any of them because the, the the argument from the atheists seem to be pretty flawed as well i mean first of all they relegate themselves to this very narrow and constricted 
way of viewing the world that is strictly reasoned and deductive. So they, they don't have the options of arguments from like ab abductive arguments, right? They, they don't have the ability to look at things uh, that are very likely or very probable. Everything has to be exact all the time. And I just couldn't get down with that. And there's flaws in some of the arguments that they make. So just to give a quick example of that. So they demand all of your arguments must be rooted in scientific evidence. And then in debate after debate after debate, cosmologically, they would uh, refute certain granted their fallacious fine tuning arguments by resorting to refutations related to the, um, the strong anthropic principle, which relies it's a necessary assumption of that argument is that there is and does exist a multiverse, which clearly there's also no evidence for, nor could there be. And so I just kind of wanted to turn to them and be like, well, what happened to your demand for evidence? Where did that go? And so I, I was stuck in the middle because there was obviously a lot of um, conflict, I guess. I, I, they contradict themselves a lot. Some of the guys that are making arguments for Christianity and those contradictions turned me off. So I was turned off of both sides. And what Peterson did that caught my attention was, you know, and I don't, I, I'm not claiming that he reconciled this argument between science and religion, but he was the first person that made an argument in favor of religion that he backed up with scientific literature. And it's the first time I ever heard anyone do that. And it was in a way, it was in a way that you could feel intuitively was on to something. And so I, I just continued to follow him as much as I could. Uh, and so I don't want to present myself as something I'm not. I'm just a, an interested random lay person that's done a great deal of reading and a great deal of listening. And I am strictly here in the context of defending that Jordan is not in fact a globalist, but I'm open to discuss and even learn about any, any other subject that you want to talk about. Now, I thought that was a good introduction. They're going to talk about Jordan Peterson, whether or not he's a globalist, and they'll get into that. And they'll, they're going to get into, Rachel's going to have a rather interesting take on Peterson coming up. But I, I thought that lays out in a good way what I've heard a lot of people say about Jordan Peterson. Now, the aspect of it in terms of, in terms of the validation power of science in this conversation and behind this movement is important. And this is something that Rachel's going to get into as, as the conversation develops. So here's a little bit more. My criticisms of Jordan, um, first and foremost, they, they, my criticisms don't really fall within the domain of all the things he said outside of his expertise because I just don't listen to them. I don't listen to what he says outside of his own domain of expertise because I'm just not interested in that. My biggest problem has always been, until recently, is something that was brought up in his debates, the, the four part with Sam Harris, is that he's made a good case for a God that is an abstraction, that is the byproduct of an, a process of evolution. That is a completely natural God. You can make a reductionist argument within the domain of science for that God without any need for the supernatural. And that's basically, it's similar to my God number one that he's laying out here. And, and this is what you see at towards the end of, of many of the debates that, that Peterson has with Harris. He also has, you know, eluded and, and hinted regularly at a belief in a supernatural God. And when put on the spot to reconcile the differences between his belief in a supernatural God and the case that he makes for the emergence of a natural God, he's balked at the, uh, he, I don't think he has the ability to reconcile. Even I agree. Oh well, my God. This is, this is the place where I agree as well. Um, but I think <laughs> that this is why I actually am hopeful for Dr. Peterson, because I think Bless your heart. it is at this point that he is able to, I think, start engaging with people who actually do have good arguments for the existence of a supernatural God. And, and believe well, you, there are people out there. There are plenty yeah. of um, pseudo-apologists who have- I'm, I'm not an expert, and I'm not a pseudo-apologist, and I'm not a scientist. I'm not saying you are. Things, but what I am is, is a person who's very careful about what he says and very thoughtful about argumentation and I think I have reconciled those two cases. So maybe we can get into that after we're, we're off the recording here, but 
the, I mean, I'd, I'd certainly be interested in that. But what, I, what I'm saying Jones. about Dr. Peterson is that there are people that he could be engaging with. And this is one of my criticisms. He could be engaging with people like, like Rachel um, or philosophers like Dr. William Lane Craig or Alvin Plantinga. There are people out there who have vast swaths of knowledge uh, about these topics um, and, and have very defensible, um, they have very good defenses of the Christian tradition in particular. Um, it, at, at least they have a, a good defense of classical theism. Um, I, it, but he's not choosing to really engage with these people. He, he did engage with Dr. Craig once, but it was in a tripart uh, panel with Rebecca Goldstein, who is, I believe, Steven Pinker's wife. And they, it really wasn't a, it wasn't much of a dialogue. This was a, um, this was sort of each person stood up and gave a speech, and then they, they were asked questions by members of the audience, and then they were able to sort of cross-examine each other. And there was one point where Dr. Craig pointedly asked uh, Dr. Peterson, "So you," he, he said something along the lines of, "I admire the fact that you want to uphold objective moral values and duties." Um, but why, why do you, why would you not ground these in a transcendent God or do you ground them in some sort of, uh, platonic, um, way? And, and Dr. Peterson sort of said, I, I, I'll, I'll ground them in a platonic way. But then just recently when he was on Dave Rubin, um, with, I think it might've been, um, Ben, he did. Um, I watched that one too. Yeah. Yes. He did admit to having a personal belief in a metaphysical God. Um, so this is him stepping outside of his reductionistic scientific naturalism into um, this world. And, and, and I think that he may have reasons for it that he's not willing to express because he's not a philosophical expert. He doesn't have a full grasp of the arguments for um, or against the uh, classical theis theism. And he doesn't necessarily have good arguments for or against. The resurrection. Now I do know, um, I briefly emailed N.T. Wright, who is a biblical scholar. Um, I think he's an Anglican bishop of, of some kind. Um, and he, I know that Dr. Peterson is supposed to be reading his book on Christ um, and that he's going to be reading Dr. Peterson's book in turn. So Dr. Peterson may very well be planning on speaking with some of these people soon. Um, but I think that this summer he's been spending too much time debating people who, I mean, really the new atheists aren't saying anything new. This is, this is sort of just re, restated old tropes. And this is the problem that I have with Jordan, is that the people he's talking with don't have anything new or interesting to say. And yet he spends so much time getting bogged down in, um, in discussions of facts versus values and things like that with Sam Harris. Sam Harris, I, I have to say personally from, from, my analysis of his arguments, particularly with Dr. William Lane Craig. When I'm gone, all my dog wants to do is play with me. Because 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 according to according to me, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Okay, so I had every video with a dog. So say hello, say hello. Mm -hmm. Are you happy I'm home? Are you going to let me make this video? Mm -hmm. Let's hope so. I'm going to pause. I'll get a toy. So if you hear growling, it's uh, you know you know what's going on. Faith that they had. Uh, he's not very substantive, and 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 in the in the debates with Dr. Peterson, I think that really shows because they he keeps missing it this whole time. I think Dr. Peterson is is wasting a lot of his time at this point. So First why time. is he choosing? That's that's what's been interesting to me, Jonathan Pajot. Now now before we go, I should that was Micah. In this and, and Micah in this debate now again I don't know the panelists but but Micah sample Micah seems to be a student and he sort of represents he might be Protestant and maybe he'll come into the come into the comments and let us know a little bit who he is but he, he's representing the the group that would like to see Jordan Peterson become a come into the fold and become a confessing Christian and so he's been hoping that Peterson will peterson is on this journey so cody starts out and cody kind of represents the individuals out there who had been into the atheists are now interested in peterson and some of whom have have gone all the way into becoming christian christians mike is the individual in this panel that that identifies as a christian and is hoping along with many others that peterson will make this journey 
and become a, a full-blown confessing Christian. <laughs> Rachel is a Roman Catholic, and again, as I said, a medievalist, and you'll, you'll get to hear some of her own agendas in this. And I have done two videos, and Jonathan and I did a first video a year and a half ago where we talked about my encounters with Milo and what I was seeing in Jordan and then about Mary, right? Jordan, Jonathan is a good friend of jo Jordan's, and in a video that Jordan, Jonathan did with Jordan about a year ago, he specific, with a, Milo came up and he specifically said, you know, Rachel Fulton Brown's been wanting to talk to you. So it, it really isn't that Jordan hasn't been not now, now Rachel is is kind of a Milo apologist. She's a friend of Milo. She's been studying Milo, and so that some of you who watch, if if you watch the whole video, this will some this is probably something you'll react to. Nudged in in various directions, right? George, Jonathan has nudged him to me, and he's not taking that up. As I said, we were in conversation. I'm thinking that Jordan is choosing not to have these conversations. And again, I think Corey is fair in saying, you know, we can't attribute intention to him that we can't, we don't, we're not inside his head. But I do think it's interesting that he's spending more time talking with certain kinds of people than with others. And that's why I'm skeptical about your hope, Micah. So, so Rachel thinks that Jordan has been intentionally avoiding people like N.T. Wright, and others who want to have more substantive conversations about Christianity. And I, I think it's, it's important to, again, not read Jordan Peterson's mind, not look too much into this. I'm getting, I'm getting a, an education on people watch my videos and then they have ideas about who I am and what's going on in my life. And then they send me things, uh, send me ideas and letters, letters of concern over all those things. It, it strikes me, and all this well-intentioned, and I, I appreciate people's uh, desire to look out for me and look out for my welfare. Some imagine that I'm going this way or that way politically. Some imagine that I'm, I'm losing the faith or I'm a hardcore evangelical. It's, it's amazing all the different people that I am out there in the world, especially knowing the person that I am right here in myself. So it's, it's important not to you know, get too deeply into this game about where Jordan Peterson is going, who he is. But at the same time, Micah's points that the kinds of people that Peterson is talking to have been interesting. And now Rachel's pause in that, you know, there's, it's not like it's hard to find Christians that um, are willing to talk. Christians are usually very willing to talk. And, and there'd be many who would who would want to talk to Jordan Peterson, but I would imagine Peterson, like I, I think about my own journey in this and people sometimes have questions, well, who do I talk to? Well, I often talk to people who come to me for one reason or another and they have their agenda. It's always very interesting for me listening what other people who are listening to this are thinking about, but yet at the same time, I tend to follow the things that interest me and what goes into that computation of interest. Well, it's, it's not, I, I'm, I'm, I'm probably, in terms of this part of my life, I'm fairly intuitive. I just kind of go from one thing to the next that intrigues me and interests me. And so then people are frustrated. I'm not reading enough Jung. I'm reading too much Jung. I'm not reading enough philosophy. Oh, this philosophy stuff is too much. You should stick to reading the Bible, on and on and on. Everyone always has agendas for everyone else's life. But the question here is, Where does Peterson really stand with respect to this journey of his, and with whom does he want to uh, does he want to share this journey? Who are his guides? Now, I think again, a lot of confession Christians are highly motivated to have Peterson become a confessing Christian. Peterson might not be motivated at all to become a confessing Christian. Peterson might be just continuing his own journey of discovery in this and he'd rather talk with McGill Christ or or whoever he's talking to or he'd rather go talk to a quarter of a million people two or three thousand of them at a time every night as he does his rambling uh petersonian evangelistic crusade which is what this book tour has become so it's it's hard to know but but here this group is i, I like i liked this conversation because they were articulating a lot of the different voices that I've been hearing out there in the comment section, emails that I get. And again, sorry, I'm very backlogged on email with the death of my sister and all of my travels over this last month. So, but, but it's very interesting how a lot of the voices that I hear out there, I, I heard in this conversation.
Uh, I, Michael, I, well, I just want to address your point about how uh, the new atheists aren't saying anything. I want to make a recommendation. If you haven't already watched it, go watch the follow-up interview that Brett Weinstein recently did, where he gives his take on the progress that was made between Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson. Because he and, and that was an interesting video done by Rebel Wisdom. And again, I really appreciate the work that Rebel Wisdom is doing. I, I didn't, I don't know, <laughs> Brett Weinstein sure has a better place of looking at it. I, I'm not, I wasn't impressed by the so-called progress that was made by those conversations. Maybe I'd be curious to hear Peterson's take on it. I don't think Sam Harris budged a bit. I think Sam Harris basically, you can watch the videos I've done on that, but I, I, I think, I think Brett learned something. And again, I continue to appreciate Brett, even though. I think his assumptions about morality are unexplored. He was the moderator for some of their talks, and he recently gave an interview with his thoughts on those where he elaborated and kind of laid out what progress exactly had been making, had, had been made there, sorry. Uh, and uh, he, he talks about the hard pill that each of them had to swallow and the ground that each of them gave. And the, the hard pill that Sam Harris had to swallow and the ground that he gave as Brett lays it out in the video, I think will be particularly interesting to you because he, one, at least one of the new atheists has some new things to say and has had to take some considerations in this game. And so for 10 years, as the new atheists cut a swath of destruction through theism all across the world, the, for the first time somebody has actually stepped up to the plate, that's someone to contend with. And they have had to swallow some hard pills and some ground has been made. So. Maybe watch that video and, and take what Brad has to say into consideration there, because I think it's valuable. I, I think actually Brett Weinstein has forced the new atheists to swallow some hard pills. I think Jordan Peterson has impacted the community that had followed the new atheists. Okay, well let's and I, let's. I would uh, certainly be willing to do that, but just from what I have, uh, what I have seen, particularly. I think Dr. Craig brought up the moral argument, um, the, the argument for, for God from objective moral values and duties. And Sam's, and of course this was years ago, so Sam may have developed further with these discussions with Jordan, but there he wasn't saying anything new. I, I really haven't seen much new in uh, atheistic philosophy since Bertrand Russell or since Antony Flew, really. And then even Antony Flew became, ended up becoming a, a sort of theist towards the end of his life because he realized that it was untenable um, to, to remain a reductionistic naturalist. But I, I think that we can, we can set that comment. Right. We can yeah. set Peterson is very much against of, Marxism. Uh, Marxism. I mean, he talks about it all the okay. time. Right. And that's why I think he is actually Marxist. Now this part of the video is going to interest some of you because Rachel is going to make an argument that Peterson is a Marxist and the, the host, let's see what his name is. Sorry, I don't know all your names. Uh, the moderator, Greg, um, makes the point that, hey, Peterson's very anti-Marxist. And now, Rachel's, hear Rachel's argument. It's kind of interesting. I can make that argument let's, better than Vox. Okay. okay. Let's get on, let's, let's uh, get oh, on. Oh, no, please. I'd like to hear what Rachel has to say. Okay, so this is this is the root of the globalist question. Say, so I I think I think so. What I think Jordan is 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 a disappointed Marxist, right? We know from his own his description of his own political activities when he was younger that he was a socialist. He has surrounded himself in his own house, as witnessed in the preface to 12, 12 Rules, with socialist art, with Soviet era propaganda posters and such and the way that he talks about his disappointment with marxism suggests to me a deep betrayal right and again we're, we're it's very hard not to psychologize a psychologist he he invites it right what the reason i think that he's he's it's interesting that she uses the word betrayal here i think a deep disappointment i think peterson's been pretty open about his own individual journey in the introduction to maps of meaning he he's he's peterson has been very transparent about his personal life throughout this journey so a betrayal that's a that's a pretty strong word fundamentally marxist rather than fundamentally christian he thinks that the ground of all existence is suffering 
And now that's an interesting that's an interesting argument that the, the ground of all existence is suffering because that of well does Peterson think that the ground of all existence is suffering? I think Peterson I think Peterson has asserted that suffering is a better way into the conversation with the materialists, and I think that's part of Peterson's attempt to be ecumenical as he tries to look at the mythological landscape beyond Christianity. Maybe it's my Calvinism. We're going to talk a little bit about Calvinism later with uh, Mike is going to go into some of that. But so, so I don't know if Rachel is correct there, but let's let's continue to listen to her. And again, I'm, I'm pausing her. And if you want to listen to the whole thing, you know, listen to the whole thing, but it's two and a half hours long. Um, and, and that is not that is not a Christian understanding of, of reality or of the existence of creation. As Christians, we understand that creation is good. We start from God loves us. Creation is good. We do not start from, and that's and when Jordan and Sam are having that big argument about what the you know sort of what what the thing is we can start from. What Jordan tries to get Sam to admit is suffering, right? The reality of life is suffering. Well, and 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 Rachel is is correct about Christianity. There, I would I would say that the the foundation is joy. This would take a longer argument than well. We could he kind of he kind of hints at the 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 Buddhism, and maybe he's. I, 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 I'm not going can to. Can I read some Feuerbach to you? No, yes, you, to, you can read Feuerbach. This is what say, I'm To say that. Now, what she does here is she reads some of her blog. And so if you want to read the entire blog, you can found it, find it at her website, fencingbear at prayer.blogspot.com. If Professor, Pe if Professor Jordan B. Peterson said he believed in God, would you? And this, this is going to get into her larger argument, which I think is is more interesting where she asserts again as did cody that it's this relationship with science that has been moving a lot of the former adherents to the new atheists and and that makes a lot of sense because the part let's say let's if we would imagine the listeners to the four horsemen are their congregation they've been preaching science and what you hear right away in cody's introduction is that science evidence science evidence science evidence and the more they bang those drums it gets into their audience's head and their then their audience begins to look at what they're saying and say wait a minute you guys aren't following your own precepts it, it isn't about science and then peterson comes along and peterson begins to make his case for a traditional Christian mythos by using science. And that's what's been moving many people to take a closer look at Christianity, a closer look at psychology, a closer look at the Bible, and all of this. So now, now Rachel does not come at this in from the same place that Cody does. Ra Rachel comes at this as an academic. And and what she does, I think this is a very helpful, when she read this, I thought, wow, this is really helpful in terms of understanding some of the roots of, of Feuerbach. Now, before she reads too much Feuerbach, I wanted to play a little bit from, many of you know this from some of my previous videos, a little bit from Philip Carey's Philosophy and Religion in the West, because he treats Hegel, and then before he gets into Marx, he gets into Feuerbach, and, and that's a rather interesting treatment. In our last lecture, we followed the history of Geist through all of world history, culminating in Hegel's own philosophy, where Geist comes to self-knowledge through Hegel's philosophizing. In one interpretation of Hegel, Hegel's philosophy itself constitutes absolute knowledge. Um, that may, may not be what Hegel actually had in mind. And in any case, it certainly isn't what happened. It's not as if history came to an end after Hegel finished writing his philosophy. Uh, there was much else that happened. Religion was still on the scene, for instance. Religion, which for Hegel had been subsumed in this conceptual uh, begriff of philosophy. Uh, religion in its unsubsumed, unconceptualized form still remained on the scene in the form of churches and synagogues and so on. And there was indeed a lot of history going on in the 19th century after Hegel. And one of the key issues for 
Hegelian philosophers after Hegel was precisely what to make of religion and its social and political function. Imagine you're in 19th century Germany. The churches are very important. They're state-supported. They tend to have uh, rather old-fashioned, sometimes repressive and authoritarian ideas about political and social life. Most Hegelian philosophers were liberals. They wanted more secularization. They wanted more freedom from the authoritarian um, uh, the authoritarian strictures of the church. They wanted more free thought. So the issue for a Hegelian philosopher in the generation after Hegel was what shall we make of religion? Especially what do we make of this philosophical subsumption or Aufhebung of religion proposed by Hegel? We all agree, all of us Hegelians, that philosophy subsumes religion. That is, it, it cancels the, the old picture thinking form of religion and subsumes it to a level of, um, picks it up and raises it to a level of conceptual sophistication. Now, now that's an important point that, that Kerry makes because that is implicit in a lot of this conversation, that, that religion is subsumed and, and in all fairness, you see that with Peterson. You see that in Peterson, his intense interest in religion, but his lack of intense interest to participate in a church. And, and this is true this is true much more broadly in society as well. And, and so you have those who confess Christ, you have those who like to study Christianity, study it in the abstract, study it in terms of a philosophy, and then you have those who, who actually practice Christianity in terms of worship, in terms of observance, in terms of living within a community that at one level or another has a degree of accountability in terms of our lives and beliefs. And so you, you get the sense here of this transition after Hegel, 19th century Europe, Christianity is continuing to recede in many ways, especially among the elites, especially among the intellectuals. Intellectualism is starting to rise, and now you're gonna see a split in the Hegelian community. Uh, of philosophical sophistication. But does that mean then, that something like Christianity is canceled by philosophy or preserved by philosophy. Remember that the subsumption of an opposition by um, the Hegelian dialectic is ambiguous and deliberately so. It means both canceling and preserving. So what is it that's canceled about the Christian religion? What is it that's preserved about the Christian religion? Uh, is philosophy fundamentally something that abolishes religion or something that preserves its essential truth? If you think that uh, philosophy is, is aimed at abolishing religion in its current historical form, then you're a left-wing Hegelian. If you think that philosophy preserves what's really essential about religion, then you're a right-wing Hegelian. And it tended to be that the Hegelians did divide in this way, left-wing and right-wing. There's very few that managed to preserve the, the ambiguity of Hegel intact. So the left-wing Hegelians, were critics of religion. They thought that philosophy's job was to help abolish religion because religion for the left-wing Hegelians was a form of authoritarian unfreedom from which philosophy and its critical apparatus should free the human spirit. Philosophy has the goal of critique, of freeing humanity from this form of unfreedom called religion. That's the view especially of Ludwig Feuerbach, one of the now, now this, this liberating Christianity from the unfreedom of religion, you'll hear that theme pretty strongly in The Four Horsemen. And, and this, this continues to this day. Leading left-wing Hegelians. And he, philosophy's job was to help bit. abolish religion. Because religion for the left-wing Hegelians was a form of authoritarian unfreedom from which philosophy and its critical apparatus should free the human spirit. Philosophy has the goal of critique, of freeing humanity from this form of unfreedom called religion. That's the view especially of Ludwig Feuerbach, one of the leading left-wing Hegelians. And he is in turn the starting point of Marx's philosophy. So Feuerbach represents the transition from Hegel to Marx. Hegel, pardon me, Feuerbach 
is a left-wing Hegelian. He's a critic of religion. He argues that the idea of God is a form of alienation, right? Uh, so as opposed to Hegel, who, who talks about Geist alienating itself in history, Feuerbach is looking from a human perspective and talking about God as an alienation of human consciousness. Feuerbach wants to start with human consciousness, not with uh, a, a, a grand story of this kind of divine Geist. He wants to start with human consciousness, real species being, Feuerbach will call it, the species being of us as human beings. And where does God fit into this picture? God fits into the picture as an alienated form of human being. And now, now, this is going to be important in terms of what Rachel reads in from the essence of Christianity written by Feuerbach in the middle of the 19th yeah. century. As basically something that we made in our own image and then didn't recognize that it's really just an image of us. I, I find that fascinating. Again, with in my pastoral work, I work with people who hear voices. And so in the past, I've done reading on that. One of the theories about people who hear voices is that the voice that they're hearing is their own, which makes perfect sense inside their head, but they can't recognize their voice. And, and in a sense, what, what Feuerbach is about to say is that that's exactly who God is. God is God is me, but I don't recognize my, I don't recognize that I am in fact projecting. And, and you can begin to see the beginnings of a whole train of thought that of course will come to full flower in Freud in terms of his critique of religion. So the, this, this alienation theory, and, and then of course when you get to Marx, alienation is going to take much more of a materialist turn. So Feuerbach proposes what has been called a projection theory of religion. Religion is basically uh, human beings projecting their own essence up into the sky, into this imaginary being called God, who is supposed to be perfect love, perfect power, perfect righteousness. All of those are human qualities, really, Feuerbach thinks, right? We take what we hope for, for, for human beings, human justice, and we project it up in the sky and pie on the sky sorts of things and say, well, we don't really have justice on this earth, but up in heaven we'll have justice. And so we're taking something that could be real, human justice, and projecting it in this alien form uh, upon this uh, imaginary being in the sky. And likewise with love and power and all those other divine attributes, which for Feuerbach are really human attributes, uh, which we um, alienate from ourselves and don't realize it. We project it onto God, which is an alien power, which really ought to be ourselves, right? The real object of worship ought to be ourselves. We should revolve around ourselves, not around this imaginary God for Feuerbach. So Feuerbach has this theory of alienation that he uses to critique religion. Now Marx is an inheritor of both Feuerbach and Hegel. Marx wants to take Feuerbach's theory of alienation and apply it to the situation of the worker under capitalism. Right? And that's why he'll come up with a theory of alienated labor. The, alienati the alienation part of that theory comes from Feuerbach. Marx is a Feuerbachian in his early writings who wants not just to theorize about human alienation, but to do something to change it. Right? Alienation isn't evil. We ought to do something to change it. Hence, in one of his early writings, the famous Theses on Feuerbach, Marx concludes, the philosophers so far have only interpreted the world, but the point is to change it. Right? And so eventually Marx will propose a way of changing the world, what he calls revolutionary practice, the practice of communist revolution. Now, in order to understand the shape that alienation takes in the real world, right, not the shape of, of alienation and externalization of ideas, you have to look at what Marx will call the material world. Hegel's dialectic, Hegel's dialectic is a dialectic of history that's all about ideas, consciousness, right? For Marx, the real dialectic of history is not idealist. It's not an, a, a dialectic of consciousness. It's a dialectic of material forces. So Marx is a materialist. He calls his position dialectical materialism. But what drives history, therefore, is not ideas, but material forces. Yet these material forces are not just stones and, and other material objects in that dull sense. When Marx talks about material forces, he means especially economic forces. And he's going to go on and develop 
than his that particular chapter on Marx. And it's actually, I, re I do recommend Philosophy and Religion in the West by Philip Carey. It's on Audible. It's, I thought it was a terrifically helpful course. But that adds a little bit of background to where, to where Rachel is about to go, because Rachel is, is saying that, that Jordan Peterson is a betrayed Marxist, which, nope, I haven't heard anybody make this argument before, so that let's Jordan's hear her make Marxist it. Is, is, is primarily to say that his fundamental understanding of religiosity comes via via Marx from Feuerbach. Now, I, I, I've checked in Mavsamini. He seems to know of Feuerbach's existence, but he doesn't understand the degree to which Feuerbach, Marx is reading Feuerbach. And a lot of what Marx's Hegelianism is via Feuerbach. So we'll say Jordan is Feuerbach. So I did this post called, um, if Professor Jordan B. Peterson said he believed in God, would you? Right, and and it starts with the, the, the tweet where Jordan said, this was June 25th, 2018. God is the mode of being you value the most as demonstrated or manifested in your presumption, perception, and action, right? He's been pressed a lot to try to define what he means by God. So there he was in his tweet. And um, one of the things I started with was saying, why does, why does everybody care, right? And both Micah and Corey have verified what I said in my blog post. What matters is that Jordan identifies himself as a scientist and that that scientific perspective seems to mean that if we can trust him to be able to get to a belief in God, he's validated our our primary um, faith faith position in modernity, which is the science, right? The now, again, I would critique Rachel there and say, let's not paint our hours and our we's way too large. I think especially for the group of people that were participating in the church of Sam Harris that elevated reason and science. And again, this is what Cody says at the beginning of the video. Those people will be greatly influenced by Peterson because Peterson is in a sense, these, now we got another biblical reference repeat. Peterson is in a sense, the apostle Paul walking into Judaism and, and Peterson now has a new gospel to give to the people in the synagogue of Sam Harris, and, I'll, and he's splitting the synagogue. And I'm, I'm using this reference because if you read the book of Acts, Paul comes into the synagogues throughout the diaspora and starts preaching that Jesus is the Messiah and God has raised him from the dead. And what he does is he splits these synagogues and terrible fights ensue. But, but that is, in a sense, what, what, in, what, what Jordan Peterson is doing. Now, for someone like Rachel, who had already had her own journey into faith and into the Roman Catholic Church and into all the things that she's into, that wasn't, you know, that that wasn't her journey. But for someone like Cody, that is his journey. And for someone like Micah, who's kind, who's been over, I imagine again, I, I didn't examine everyone's credentials. Someone who's been a part of a, of a confessional church, he sees this as a win. So everybody's looking at it from their tribal perspective, and they're evaluating it. And but but some like like Rachel, and again. If you watch the whole video, you'll you'll get a sense of where Rachel's at right now because she's she's pretty transparent too, and she's got her own axes to grind. But I thought the inclusion of Feuerbach in this is interesting. Now, whether whether you can continue to whether you should continue to call someone a Marxist if they have become in many ways anti-Marxist because they feel betrayed by Marxism. Well, I don't know if that that's fair, but that all that dynamic is, of course, well known. Uh, many of the people who were raised in the church and felt betrayed by the church become the most hostile towards the church. So it could be that a a, a big piece of Peterson's shrill anti-Marxism is because he feels betrayed. So that that could be a factor in Peterson. Who knows? But again, we have, we've all got our filters. We've all got our histories. We've all got our axes. Now, Rachel has her axe. Jordan Peterson has our axe. The question isn't so much, should we dismiss, this is the this is C.S. Lewis's point about vulvarisms. Should we dismiss someone because they have an axe? No, everybody has an axe. The question is, listen to the argument, weigh it, see what's valid in it, and, and continue to recalibrate and readjust 
the filters through which we listen to individuals. So let's let Rachel finish her argument. Well, what's interesting is most you can, and I, I'm not going to read absolutely all the FOIA bot, but you go to that post, you'll find most of it. So for example, Peterson says, I'll read it again and I'll read it slowly. God is the mode of being you value the most as demonstrated or manifested in your presumption, perception, and action. And I use as a, a illustration for that his when you wish upon a star. Um, this is Feuerbach, and it's a long quotation, but I'll read it carefully because you guys are Jordan. You're, you guys are Jordan fans, right? So you're used to this de level of of depth. Okay, Feuerbach. Every man must place before himself a god, that is, an aim, a purpose. The aim is the conscious, voluntary essential impulse of life, the glance of genius, the focus of self-knowledge, the unity of the material and spiritual in the individual man. He who has an aim has a law over him. He does not merely guide himself, he is guided. He who has no aim has no home, no sanctuary. Aimlessness is the great, greatest unhappiness. Even he who has only common aims gets on better, though he may not be better, than he who has no aim. An aim sets limits, but limits are the mentors of virtue. He who has an aim, an aim which is in itself true and essential, has, eo ipso, a religion. If not in the narrow sense of common pietism, yet, and this is the only point to be considered, in the sense of reason, in the sense of the universal, the only true love, end quote. All of that is what Peterson is trying to say when he does the thing about when you wish upon a star, right? And I, I swear when she read that, I thought, yeah, that, that something, a paragraph like that could have come straight out of Maps of Meaning. And so I think Rachel really Meaning nails it there. The thing that gives you goal, purpose, meaning, religion, right? Okay, so that's one. Um, Peterson says in another tweet from the same day, quote, God is that in which you manifest necessary faith. Necessary, because you have to start somewhere, and this necessary axiom is not a fact, but a way of mode of being, which is to say, a personality. Feuerbach. To predicate personality of God is nothing else than to declare personality is the absolute essence. But personality is only conceived in distinction, in abstraction from nature. In the personality of God, man consecrates the supernaturalness, immortality, independence, unlimitedness of his own personality. God is the idea of personality as itself a person, subjectivity existing in itself apart from the world, existing for self alone, without once posited as absolute existence, the me without a thee speculate as much as you will you will never derive your personality from god if you have not beforehand introduced it if god himself be not already the idea of your personality your own subjective nature now, now again if you understand philip carey's point about feuerbach that quote out of feuerbach makes absolutely perfect sense now i i think peterson definitely has that element in what he's doing when I when I listen to let's let's set aside the the Ruben Shapiro Peterson the recent one where Peterson definitely gets more metaphysical but if you, if you look at the main thrust that Peterson is taking with Sam Harris Peterson is making a much stronger argument that in fact uh, God number one is built into us down below and, and Peterson does make that point with with Ruben with Ruben and Shapiro in the more recent video. But there, there definitely is some Feuerbach in Peterson. And I think, I think Rachel, Rachel hit, she noticed that I guess she teaches Feuerbach as, as part of a class, I don't know. But she, she really nailed that. And, and those quotes are, those quotes are startling. The point about Feuerbach is that he is the one that or, is the origin of all of the everything, right? Via Hegel, postmodernism is basically Feuerbach because as Feuerbach explains religion, it's the, it's the projection of species consciousness. Let me unpack that. Human beings, unlike other creatures, 
he doesn't really say creatures, unlike other th not animals, right? We have a consciousness of ourselves as belonging to a species that we um, understand ourselves as, as, as existing, um, not as just isolated individuals, but is belonging to the, this idea of species consciousness is the direct antecedent to Marx's idea about class, class consciousness. That the postmodernists now speak in terms of the collectivity, this consciousness of yourself, your identity is defined through your race, through your gender, through your belonging to the collective, has a direct lineage back to Feuerbach. Everything that Jordan says about God is from Feuerbach's essence of Christianity. It's a fundamentally atheist understanding which is fundamentally scientific and has no existence of the transcendent except in so far and this is where jordan constantly says this kind of thing you project yourself into your understanding of yourself as belonging to the species and that belongs entirely in his understanding of true religiosity coming out of evolution evolutionary psychology i can unpack all of that if you like well i don't i don't think that's <laughs> necessary I don't think they're up for it. <laughs> I, I think Rachel has a good point. I don't know if this, you know, her, her point as I hear it is that Peterson is coming at God from an atheist perspective. Okay. Uh, her larger point in the video is that Peterson's view of God is deficient from her point of view. Okay. Okay. But, you know, and then I, I'm a little bit more, I'm a little bit more near Micah and saying, well, is Peterson on a journey? The the union aspect of Peterson is is really for me the wild card in terms of his journey, because no one would have said that Carl Jung was someone heading towards, let's say, if you're an evangelical American evangelical Christian, that that Carl Jung was on a path towards becoming an a neo-evangelical in the middle of the 20th century. The way that Jung deals with Christianity, at least to the degree that I've been able to recognize it, is 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 different. And there's a reason that neo-evangelicals, that's the tradition, Billy Graham, uh, Carl F. Henry, on in the West, and, and the British, the British evangelicals too, the British neo-evangelicals. So it's complicated. It's complicated. So that's this is this is this is part of this is part of Rachel Rachel Brown's big yeah but with respect to Peterson, and and her her guy is Milo, which is an interesting choice for a guy. But I mean, what what you're saying though is because he's he's shared some thought processes with Feuerbach, might maybe not necessarily because he read Feuerbach, but. That doesn't mean he's It's a the Marxist. philosophical tradition that he's working with. Absolutely. He, he, so um, let me address he quotes Dostoevsky. He quotes the same scene from Dostoevsky's um, Brothers Karamazov every single time anybody asks him about Christ, right? So I don't, he, he has yet to quote anybody else when he's talking about how he understands Christianity. That makes me skeptical. And he quotes Jung a lot. Right. Yeah. Well, he's so, a Jungian for sure, and he's definitely Jungian. Jungian. And 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 the and the sort of I was drawn to the archetypes. I wrote to him about that. Right. I'm I'm interested in that idea. What I appreciate now is the reason the archetypes are scientific. They they feel scientifically robust is because Jordan weds them with an evolutionary psychological argument, which also has its weaknesses. As Corey is pointing out to me, saying, "Well, an intellectual lineage doesn't prove what he thinks." Evolutionary arguments don't answer the problem of morality either, because right. absolutely everything that we are is evolved, including our viciousness to each other. E evolutionary arguments uh, answer every question. So right, they're just okay, so stories. What, I, what I'm saying, what I what I've been saying is is exactly that 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 ethics cannot be solved by evolution because evolution Good. has given us the capacity to do literally everything that we do, including murder. Right. So, that's not that's not a good enough explanation. However, I do view this as sort of the the second book that God has given to us. So so he's given us two books. He's given us scripture and then he's given us natural revelation. This this is a very old Christian position. This is a position that's found in one of the doctrinal statements of my denomination, the Belgian Confession, that God reveals himself in two books. God reveals himself through scripture. God reveals himself through general revelation. And, and again, in this conversation, Micah 
Micah is, of, of these people, Micah is probably closest to my tradition in terms of the confessional seat in which he sits. Evolution can serve in many ways as natural revelation um, for us to understand more about him. And it can, if we allow it to, it can point towards him. So insofar as these evolutionary arguments work, my position is that they are actually pointing to an even deeper reality. They, they are evidence for an ethic rather than an explanation for the origin of an ethic. And, and I wanna to get to something that you said earlier about this, uh, this notion of Dr. Peterson's that we sort of start from suffering. Um, mm -hmm. I think that what he's doing is he may be, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I seem to rem recall um, that in the Maps of Meaning book, he, he details the fact that he grew up in a Presbyterian household now, Presbyterian, so did I. Right. Presbyterianism, as you probably well know, is founded uh, largely upon the thought of John Calvin in many ways. It's, it's within the Reformed tradition. And one of John Calvin's um, main points, or at least the main points that were brought from his theology, is that of total depravity of right. man. And so there's, a, there's sort of this starting point for, for Calvinists, at least, Calvinist Christians, in the suffering and the depravity. Yeah. Well, and, the, and that's where Vox kind of humanity. contradicts himself because he talks like a Calvinist. I think, I'm pretty sure Vox is a Calvinist, but he talks about, yes. you know, original a, original a sin, and he states, I, I'd have to go way back to quote it, but roughly speaking, he states that we are evil. If you're evil, then you're without God. If you're <laughs> Except Jesus says, when he talks about the the parable of the 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 scorpions and the fish, um, even though you who are evil give good things to your children, uh, Jesus calls us all evil. Me being a Calvinist, you are without God. You are suffering. So he's saying right. the exact same thing that he is refuting and basically calling Peter's an antichrist. And th this is where I got summoned into the room. There it is right there. I hadn't noticed this before in the recording. <laughs> now I know why I got summoned into the room. Someone said Calvinist, and I was summoned on Facebook. He's saying the same damn thing in a Calvinistic sense. I think well, that's what I, re what ridiculous. What I think is that Dr. Peterson hasn't been introduced to a sophisticated form of Christian theism. I no, think I think his theism is, is has, very, very amateur, and he needs to... Like you've stated before, he needs to talk to folks like Rachel and other people that are very knowledgeable about these things that can better educate him and challenge him on those things. Because I think he is very amateur on his understanding. Now, he understands the, the metaphysical nature of what, you know, you know, like in his biblical series that are very intriguing and interesting. But theistically, he's, he's a novice, I think. And Vox goes in and claims... Oh, he, he did the biblical series and claimed he never read the Bible. I can't find any. Well, he, he he hasn't. He he says he hasn't. I mean, he, I. So okay, as a scholar, Jordan's embarrassing, right? Because he got really excited about finding this. You know, one of the biblical sites that gives you the commentaries and the scripture. It's like that's what I work on, right? And he he. I mean, it's sort of delight. It's it's kind of endearing in certain ways because like, oh my gosh, there's this site that has all these commentaries on it. It's like, yes, Jordan, we've all been talking about it. You're not the only one that's discovered it. So you know, right? But yeah. for him, this is new. What I'm what I'm saying is that the the kind of Christianity he's been introduced to throughout his life is the sort of fundamentalist anti-intellectual tradition that yes sparked in opposition to theological liberalism. And so when he's when he's when he's at that crossroad, you think he'd be dying to talk to me, don't you? I would hope, but well, I think yeah, that when absolutely. He's at that crossroad, <laughs> theological liberalism. I was very sweet for months. Well, and here, here's other right. things that Fox Day is kind of. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, sorry. No, well, I, I was just going to say that I, I can't understand why somebody with two million followers wouldn't want to come on here and spend a, an hour and forty five yeah, minutes right. and not get. <laughs> <laughs> <the invitation. laughs> <laughs> you did. I mean, we well, hold, on, hold on a second. Do Dr. Peterson has talked with people smaller than us in the past. So uh, the, our size has nothing to do with whether or not they'll talk to us, I think. I think that Dr. Peterson will talk to people um, if he views the discussion itself as going to be in the long run productive. Um, and I think that I, I for him, what he's well, if you're having productive discussions, millions of people will follow you. Not necessarily. Yeah, not necessarily. But 
I mean, it, you can, you can, the reason <laughs> millions of people will follow him is because he's speaking to the speaking to them now, right? Nothing he is saying is actually that that controversial. To I, I would say not because he's speaking to them now. It has everything to do with the way he's approached this and the moment, the man in the moment found himself. Peterson had been doing what he's been doing for a long time. And reality is very, 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 very complicated and layered. And just at this moment, everything came together. And and for Peterson, and I I think happily so, I think again it's it's been a it's been a good and a powerful thing. Most of the people but, you're talking to. Right, no, and I mean, so it's it, pretty basic. It does appeal to to a sort of denominator, I think, right. and it's not yes. the lowest common denominator, but it is a common denominator, and that's that's what he appeals to. I, I really genuinely think that he's he's appealing to a wide. Variety Thank you. Of people. Thank you. That's a label I've never been slapped with before. Well, I'm not saying I'm not saying you because I am I am just as interested in Dr. Peterson's work as you are, probably potentially even more so. I mean, actually, that's fair. Mike is saying it's like, of course, he's he's got all this together. We all have completely different reasons for watching him, right? So he has, you know, I I think that's you know he's clear, clearly tapped into a lot of people's interest, and we, we 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 that's why we started with what we did. It's like all the different all the different perspectives that we came to with why we were listening to him to start with. Okay, well. Right. So, I mean, this is probably our, this whole episode is going to go over our time limit, which is fine. We're we're just going to go over. Mm -hmm. um, but I want I want to get into because there's so much more to unpack here. Um, okay. But, I mean, one of so, the things. So so I, I in fact we're going to lose energy now that Corey's not with us. That's too bad. Anyway, so the the logo I. So Corey had to leave because they only do two hours usually. But but this last section I thought was I've was really quite the helpful too. Part was central to what was going on. I think Corey is at, he's made a good point. It's like it's it's easy one because Jordan has attracted so much attention and everybody cares about what he says pre precisely because he's a scientist talking about religion, and that is I I think of all of the things that he has that has attracted people's attention that's it right. Now. There have been other scientists talking about it. So Francis Collins, talk about a high status scientist talking about religions. Can Francis Collins wrote a book about his conversion to Christianity. There are a lot of scientists that have been talking about religion. Why Peterson? And again, I think it's because the Four Horsemen created a church as such around them, and Peterson is the exorcist that comes in. Peterson is the Apostle Paul that comes into the synagogue of the new atheists and splits it open. It's now why, how he gathered my attention, how he gathered Rachel's attention. I mean, again, the, the man and the moment found each other. And Christians look at these things and talk about, you know, the, the providence of God and the working of God, especially if you're from a tradition like mine, which is strongly providential. So I, I don't think it's just science, like Rachel says here. I think it's the particular kind of science and the particular kind of church or synagogue that the Four Horsemen we set up. so hungry to get out of this drought of being able to talk intellectually and seriously about, I don't even say faith, because I don't think Jordan talks about faith. He talks about the divine, and he points to a transcendent that people want to be able to believe in, but I think he, I think he hedges himself. I think he hedges his bets, which is why I'm skeptical of Micah's optimism. But anyway, let's. This is this is what Jordan said that first got me listening to him because it's in the same interview with when he's asked about Milo, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and fencing bear is Milo's mama bear when it comes to these Milo conversations. Speech. Now, Western culture is foul logo centric. Let's say it. It's predicated on the idea of the logos. The logos is the sacred element of Western culture. What does that mean? It means that your capacity for speech is divine. It is the thing that generates order from chaos. And then something turns patholog and then sometimes turns pathological order into chaos when it has to. Don't estimate the, underestimate the power of truth. There's nothing more powerful than the truth. 
Now, in order to speak what you might regard as the truth, you have to let go of the outcome. You have to think, all right, I'm going to say what I think, stupid as I am, biased as I am, ignorant as I am. I'm going to state what I clear, think as clearly as I can, and I'm going to live with the consequences no matter what they are. Now, the reason you think that, that's an element of faith. The idea is that nothing brings a better world into being than the stated truth. You might have to pay a price for it, that, but that's fine. You're going to pay a price for every bloody thing you do and everything you don't do. You don't get to choose not to pay a price. You get to choose which poison you're going to take. That's it. So if you're going to stand up for something, stand up for your truth. Okay, now... Sounds what, like Socrates. Well, okay. I And this is where Vox got interesting, I think, and it's, it's partly where Greg is saying Vox got silliest, but... What does what is Jordan actually saying here? It's predicated on the idea of the logos, and we all heard that and said, "Oh, great! He's talking about the logos. He's talking about speech being divine. Logos is the sacred element of Western culture. It means that your capacity for speech is divine. It's the thing that generates order from chaos." Now that is problematic because when Feuerbach is talking about the power of speech. Feuerbach, he, he, he has this claim in which he says, you know, I'm not really an atheist. The atheists are the one that don't believe in the ideals, right? The, 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 uh, to be truly an atheist would be to say you don't believe in beauty and truth and goodness. But the problem is that Feuerbach has done a sleight of hand there, and he's saying God is simply the projection, our projection in our species consciousness of our ideals onto this personality, which we then imagine acting back on us right and i've done a lot i do every time i teach for your god essentially you're making yourself god right now that is what vox is acute that substantively that's what vox is accusing jordan if he was making that argument like you said it i i would find that a compelling intellectual argument oh i'm glad i'm more convincing than vox that's that's, that's well that's where he gets he gets down okay so just let me finish my my version of vox's possibility possible he gets down into the weeds where he's saying you know he's using alistair crowley and Jung and things like that but what the plate that the sort of substance of what he says that i think is actually possibly a danger in in jordan's understanding is that your capacity for danger now we're going to get into is jordan peterson dangerous? bring order out of chaos our speed and this is where Vox got kind of curious, right? He said, our speech can transform the world. Now, if you think about that as a Christian, you think, well, that's great. God spoke the word into being with the, you know, let there be light. But Jordan is is consistent in mapping that onto us, right? He did that in the Duncan Trussell interview. He does that regularly saying, your capacity for speech is divine. You participate in the divinity. You are the logos. You, by your own speaking, can draw order out of chaos. And then... I am persuaded that Vox maybe actually saw something that is worrisome, that that this is a magical tradition. It's magic words. I'm not I'm not sure. I, I, I very much understand Rachel's point and I see her concern. I don't think that Peterson I've never seen Peterson get into this magic reality. And and part of what I think she does at this moment is undercut the earlier argument that Peterson is a Marxist because the last thing a Marxist would do is is something like this because a Marxist is of course a materialist. So the reason I'm a little like more than a little I'm skeptical about where Jordan is coming from with his religiosity and with his in the Duncan Trussell interview, which is the one that I've heard him speak most directly about this, one, they talk about the, the psilocybin and the amia, amianita, amianita muscaria. Muscaria, the ma- magic mushrooms. And Jordan also describes the mystical experience that he had while working on the mandala, the meaning of music, listening to Mozart, and the, 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 the being or spirit or personality that came to him and spoke to him and pro- you know invited him to Yeah, and then what is he, he also talks about the Hiawatha or the whatever the other drug is but yeah jordan's done drugs ayahuasca yes he admits it in that in that duncan trussell interview he is drawn to the shamanic tradition he likes the idea of that transform i'm not sure when he's talking about the transcendent that it's anything that you actually would recognize as a christian it sounds to me very like um the 
the kind of magical transformations that indeed Crowley was interested in, in achieving. And that that's where I get anxious and suspicious yeah, but about that's a the real whole kind. But but again, she's undermining her own Marxist position here. Now you might argue that are Peterson is inconsistent. Yeah, we're all inconsistent. And and I understand her I understand her caution about the shamanic tradition, but is he is he is he a shaman or is he a Marxist? Because uh, you're kind of on two different narrow. you're kind of on that's two different sides. Narrow. No, it's not narrow. It's not with, narrow. With Crowley, but, that's a very narrow association. No, it's not because I've read all of that stuff too, right? right. And so, so, so maybe know, she. And this is, I mean, when Vox is saying he's the Antichrist, right? He's not saying he's the Antichrist. He's saying he is anti-Christian in his use of certain themes that are, appear sound to be Christian because he's using Christ language. But if you examine the theology that he's working within, simply aren't, right? Well, and I know he. And, and again, I think if you listen to Jonathan Pichot, Jonathan Pichot will say, you know, he's a he's a heretic. But Pichot has said that a number of times. Peterson is not a confessing Christian. Now, now you have the, the larger argument is what he's doing helpful. That's a much bigger conversation, I think. And it's that's a, that's a to establish the metric of helpfulness is difficult and and some people have argued that peterson is, is leading people away from christianity and those comments come up pretty regularly in my comment section and, and that's a that's a that's a conversation i think that's worth having my assumption has been a net positive think, yeah he, he's and not micah Christian. is hopeful that because he's using the language and lewis said that right he says i you know i was really interested in these these mythologies and then i came to this understanding that christianity was the myth that became history right and it, it's helpful also to read the joy davidman books it's, it's interesting because joy davidman was deeply into dianetics after her christian conversion but but joy davidman's christian conversion came as a response as 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 a response to a mystical experience that joy davidman had and, and joy davidman was a full-blown marxist and she and she was an atheist and again that joy davidman biography that i mentioned before i left fascinating biography I might read another biography about Joy Davidman just so that I don't get all my sources from one biography. But people are complicated like this. You know, we don't all come in these nice little pure packages, pure tribal packages, because, well, then you wind up, you do find people in their tr pure tribal package, and that's okay, but then there's lots of different tribes. Jordan, whenever you try to push him on the, the reality of Jesus as the incarnate word pushes it back into the abstract, pushes it back into the archetypal. He does not like talking about the possibility of the actual historical incarnation, nor does he like differentiating his own sense of divine speech from the reality of our being creatures made by God. He talks I think that's in magical a fair point. terms about the degree to which your speech I don't think he's talking in magical terms. Again, you can't have him both be a Marxist and a magician here. The thing that can transform your life. But the truth is that people's capacity for speech do transform their lives. And that isn't magical thinking. You see it in a meeting when you're in a meeting and, and the group is the group is conflicted and that's what leadership is someone someone steps up has a vision and their speech brings order out of chaos and mobilizes an institution or a group of people to go and do something amazing that is part of it's part i think it's part of image bearing it's not magical speech at all that's and when i did my that's my what we do post, i pointed to that the saying that's rather plagian I'm, a, I'm even more anxious about the seductiveness of that kind of argument now than I was back in February. Again, I think I've actually, I, I don't know if it was just to you in comments or on Facebook in general yeah. that I had qualms like it's like, where I started to go away from and have worries about Peterson. I said, well, you know, it sounds like he's 
he's trying to you know say what we already said you know like make yourself your own god and that's a dangerous territory i don't think he right but you know vox day kind of goes into the, he and he said it on his videos i don't think he is the antichrist but he goes i think he is an antichrist and in his book i think he said it a couple of times that he's uh that peterson is satanic he did, but but okay. So we, the satanic, we don't we don't we don't have to go that far to say there's worrying ways in which, whether it's from Jung, whether it, I mean, so Jung is Jung is fascinated by all this stuff too, and Crowley and and that company, it's coming out of this whole late nineteenth, early twentieth century fascination with mythology, fascination with religiosity. The comp- yeah. uh, you know the the spiritualists and you know Lewis and Tolst and. Tolkien may come out of this religion problem that we're still living with is this sort of all religions teach the same thing claim right and all religions do not teach the same thing um Christianity teaches something that it's radically at odds with paganism and now I can't remember which of the videos I've done recently I was talking about this paganism ends in human sacrifice that that was my goal right it was my, my goal the claim right that is satanic right because it's the seductiveness of being like God and that is where it becomes absolutely terrifying the degree to which you can recognize the humanity of other people is the degree to which you can recognize them as creatures made in the image and likeness of god which is a different kind of claim than you are powerful over the world by way of your speaking order into chaos uh, chaos into order by way of your speech that's divine they're they're fundamentally theologically different positions and i do not see jordan taking a proper position uh, on the the incarnation, on creation, on the soul, on our our relationship to God, any of those things. And he's oh, and one last point to before I open this back up, in the in the conversation with Duncan Trussell, he specifically says Christianity sees the soul as masculine, and that is utterly ignorant. Christianity does not see the soul as masculine. It sees either you're talking about we are creatures made in the image and likeness of God, and therefore male and female both are both are part of our 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 relationship to god or in the mystical tradition it's primarily through exegesis of the song of songs the soul is feminine right it's not the if you want to hear rachel talk about this listen to her conversations with jonathan Pajot. they go into some Jordan of this simply doesn't know this tradition right and so yeah, for yeah. Christ, christians to be drawn to the fact that he's talking about the biblical stories he's talking about christ and he's talking about but he doesn't he is not well versed in the actual christian tradition and that is in vox's vox's understanding i agree here with vox that takes people in dangerous places because it's it it, it makes you think that he's closer than he is it, what surprises me is is I, again i know very little about milo but but milo as she calls him this holy fool she doesn't seem to warn us about Milo, maybe because he doesn't have much of a following. But I, th- this is this fa- this conversation fascinated me. Um, argument. Uh, and what was I going to say here? I kind of lost my train of thought in uh, mid sentence here. So <laughs> I'll, I'll take it to Mike and while I regain my uh, thought. Yeah, process. absolutely. So so I think that Rachel, you are right to have concerns about this. However, with this new development where Dr. Peterson explicitly affirms a metaphysical God, I don't think that we can any longer uh, stick to this idea that Dr. Peterson is purely talking about a reductionistic kind of logos, which is simply our projection of ourselves onto God. Um, I think that he was in danger of falling into that, and he, he could slip back into that. That's still a danger. I think Mike is putting a little too much faith in one uh, interview that, between Peterson and Rubin. Uh, or, or the people who view his lectures ought to be aware of that, as, at least, as, well, not at least, but especially Christians ought to be aware of that. But also, I mean, he seems, he's remarkably like Socrates um, in some ways, in, in the sense of like, he even uses the, the language of you have to pick your poison in the pursuit of truth. Uh, Socrates chose truth over Athens, and he was executed for it. He was he he literally drank poison. And I want to get to a quote uh, from Justin Martyr because I think that the Church Fathers have some things that uh, they could say to to uh, Dr. Peterson here. Um, so there's a quote where Justin said in his apology 
we are taught that Christ is the firstborn of God. And we have explained above that he is the word or the logos of whom all mankind have a share. And those who lived according to reason are Christians, even though they were classified as atheists. For example, among the Greeks, Socrates and Heraclitus. I think that Dr. Peterson is coming at this. Again, you're, you're right. He doesn't understand the tradition very well, but he's coming at this with new eyes. He's coming at this from the perspective of someone who's been wrapped up in scientific naturalism and is coming to see the validity of the Christian tradition to some degree. And he's, he's making slow progress because he's really genuinely thinking about it. Um, but nonetheless, he's making progress. I, I think that we have to keep in mind that when he's talking about the logos, he's not necessarily reducing it to, to our capacity to speak. I think he, he, he focuses on that part because that's the way in which we can participate in the logos because we are- That's the only thing he ever says. I mean, that, right, that's, that's the way he, he describes it. Positing the existence of a classically theistic God um, until very recently. But I, again, I, this, this, this leap into this metaphysical claim, this is, I mean, it may not seem huge to us as people who are already Christian, but this is huge. This is a denial of everything that the scientific community has been telling him to abide by. This is a rejection of reductionistic naturalism. And, and I've got to say that this is something that, that I'm always very hopeful about. And I know that he's been talking to people who are well within the Christian tradition, secret, secretly, privately. He's been talking to people like N.T. Wright, who is a phenomenal a New Testament historian, um, who has done immense work in Christian apologetics um, regarding the, the veracity of the, the New Testament canon uh, of the Gospels uh, in particular. And, and I know that he has retweeted, for example, um, I think it was Gary Habermas's uh, minimal facts argument for the resurrection. He's looking into these things as a skeptic from. And, and he's, and he's also quoting, he's, he's also been wrestling with the trilemma, which I'll put in the, pay, I'll put in the comment section I, here, because this is the tail end of it that I caught. In the, the idea of reason as a tool of faith, that, that these are, that he could be convinced by philosophical and historical arguments for the existence of God, and then subsequently, once once he's got that in the bag, he could be convinced of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I genuinely think that. And once you have those two things, the rest will fall into place, provided that he's talking with the right people. Yeah, well, I, I think that, that brings up a couple of things. Um, is one, you know, talking to the right people, and I think some of the, the criticisms that we've had is that he seems to have stuck himself in this bubble you know the intellectual dark web you know and not really seeming to have any um at least from what we can see you know we don't know what's going on. i can't read his head but doesn't seem to have any inclination to kind of want to get out of that bubble at this time he doesn't want to really seem to challenge himself he seems like he's found a comfort zone and maybe you know he's doing that for other reasons and i, I don't want to um put motive into his actions um, but I, I think that's a good point there, and I would love to see him start to debate these things. I think Rachel is right that he is fundamentally misinterpreting um, theology from Christianity. I think it's because he's very inspired by the Jungian kind of mysticism side and like this, you know, kind of Unitarian belief structure that all religions hold a hold a bit of the truth, and not any religion has the whole truth. And so then he says, well, you know, it's he makes these misstatements about Christianity being, uh, you know, primarily male, you know. Right. And well, it's like, well, yeah, no, no, that's yeah. like that. If you look at Islam, yes, that's true. Islam is a religion for males. It is a patriarchal religion. But then if you're looking at it in Unitarian sense, you can you can see the easy jump to want to include that into uh, his understanding of Christian theology, which is obviously very wrong and so i i think there are very valid points from rachel yeah, on those well, things well, rachel right. could tell us a lot about uh we kept lady wisdom out of the temple and we've been basket cases ever since <laughs> i wrote a book about that didn't i i want to
I wanted to get that last point in. Uh, if you read Peter Brown, Peter Brown's biography of Augustine, the role that wisdom played in Augustine's conversion into Christianity is important. So anyway, that, I thought that was a really interesting conversation. I think they're, they talked about following it up with another conversation about the logo, so I'll definitely check in on that. Uh, let me know what you think. My time's about up. I have a 2 o'clock appointment. But thanks for watching, and more later.